Welcome to The Creative Endeavor. My name's Andrew, and if you're new here and you've not seen The Creative Endeavor before, this is the podcast bringing you inspiring stories from creative professionals from around the world. And in this episode, I'm talking to Vince Camp, who is an extraordinary artist and somebody that I find really, really inspiring. Now, I've been following Vince's work for a little while, and I'm really blown away by his paintings. He's got a great style, and he does some really cool figurative work. But there's something else about Vince that I find really cool, and that is if he's got an idea or he sets his mind to something, he's one of these dudes that just executes, and he just goes for it. Let me give you an example. He had this idea of doing a series of paintings based on a scenario or a story that he was writing. So he's literally writing a script and coming up with images based around this story to make a cohesive body of work. And then somebody says to him, hey, why don't you just make this into a movie? So he totally did, and it looks awesome. I'm gonna play a little bit of the trailer here. This is The Queen of Diamonds, directed and written by Vince Camp. Nice trick. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, you do. If you two want to make some real money, we can talk. You've both heard of a man called the Belgian. I don't like the sound of it. This is going. One of them has a suitcase handcuffed to his wrist. And I bet you it is full of diamonds. Come on, Kitty. This is fucking ridiculous. You need to calm down. And you, this is going to work. You have no idea who you are dealing with. Now, how cool is that? Now, his movie and his paintings, they're part of the same body of work, but it's also its own work in its own right, and it can stand alone. And I'm just really inspired by people that just execute on this level. It's really, really cool to see. So, naturally, I wanted to reach out to Vince. I wanted to ask him all about this and find out what makes him tick creatively, and also find out a little bit more about the business side of art and how he approaches his creative journey from a business standpoint. This was a great conversation. I got a heck of a lot out of it, and I hope you will too. So without further ado, here's Vince Camp in The Creative Endeavor. Vince Camp, welcome to The Creative Endeavor. It is an absolute pleasure to finally meet you. Hello, mate. Thank you so much for this chance to have a chat with you. I've been really enjoying your your podcast so far. So really looking forward to this. Awesome. Awesome. I've been following you on Instagram for a little while, and I'm I'm really intrigued by both your art and your process of how you go about making some of your fantastic figurative paintings. Uh, before we get into the nitty gritty of, of your creative process and what you're producing now, I, I'd love to just hear your start to your creative journey and, and how this all kicked off for you and, and what that what that looked like in your formative years. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Well, it starts with that classic uh, cliche of drawing so much as a child. You know, that was the only thing really that I, uh, I did in my spare time. Um, you know, we, there was no Internet and all of that, no gaming and all that. So I was just drawing and drawing, and drawing all the time, just absolutely loving it, just for the love of, of it. And and really, uh, you know, creating and, and building things was also a major part when I was younger. My dad's a, a designer of scientific equipment, but we always used to build stuff together. So it was always about building and creating uh, and writing. So storytelling was really a, a big part of, of and still is, of course, part of what I do. It's not just the painting, it's the storytelling element of it that really fascinates me. Um, so yeah, drawing as a kid, then all through school, art, studying art was never an option. My parents were Dutch immigrants and they were like, art is something you do in your spare time. You know, you, uh, you need to get a proper education. Uh, so I was like pushed into sort of sciences really and, and the 
painting was just never going to be an option for them, um, which is kind of weird because my parents are massively into art and uh, took me to galleries all over the place. And we're from a part of Holland that is, you know, has a very sort of a uh, uh, big history in, you know, the, the North Holland uh, painters, particularly in the in uh, Bergen and Alkmaar, where my parents are from, is, is you know, this is where all the great painters, you know, were from, around that sort of Amsterdam area. So Rembrandt formed a big part of my sort of education. My parents were all mad keen on Rembrandt. Um, so studying art, that was that was always weird that it was just never on the cards for me. Um, and then uh, I did a whole load of shitty jobs, you know, but always drawing, always painting you know, in the background, just as a hobby, really. And it wasn't really until my kids came along that I uh, I started pushing it a little bit more. And then I was living in London for sort of 20 years. And so uh, I started really getting much more into it when um, I decided to make a comic book for my son. We were reading loads of uh, storybooks and it was just, um, it was just really tedious and shit. And I thought, oh, I can do better than this. This is, this is ridiculous. Wow. So um, I started uh, digitally painting, um, creating this, comic book and uh this i then ended up self-publishing it did quite well and it sold in bookstores and all the rest of it oh, wow. and uh and then we moved um out of london so i could finally have my own studio so we're about sort of about 40 minutes outside of central london now and uh, i've got a big studio and i've got out my paints again and started giving it a real crack again and uh just really just painting for local people friends family portraits you know this sort of thing and it wasn't really until I, and I had a few little shows that I organized myself. And it wasn't really until I went to study in Rome with Sean Cheatham. Um, I did uh, some workshops over there with him that I, uh, I really thought about painting in the style that I wanted to paint, which is more the sort of Renaissance figurative uh, style. And he sort of gave me the, um, the nod, really. He said, well, look. You know, if you can paint like that, mate, you know, you can you can go for it. And uh, so then I uh, I ended up. Am I, mate? Am I just ranting here? Or is this no, all right? No, it's all right. It's all right. Keep yeah, going. Yeah, I just keep going. All right. So um, I was supposed to be painting these motorbikers, and I went to this show in in Tobacco Dock in London. And I was supposed to go and paint these these blokes on motorbikes as a little commission piece. And there were some barbers in there, and. Um, they're, I don't know if this is the same over where you are, but there's a, this big movement of barbers. You know, they've got this real look. You know, they've got the beards, tattoos, and all the rest of it, and they've got a really strong sort of uh, image, and it's it's really popular, you know, around here. And so I saw these guys, and like I've been to a barber for years. You know, I've got no fucking hair, so I uh, so I, I saw these barbers at this motorbike show, and they were cutting hair and. Um, they had this fantastic look and I thought there's something else going on here. There's these guys had narrative just in the way they looked and what they were up to, you know, and, and I thought there's something else going on. You know, they're not just cutting hair, they're making deals. There's all sorts of surreptitious behavior, I'm sure going on behind the scenes. And so these stories just started building in my head and I thought, Oh, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to go around London. And I'm going to paint all these barbers and, uh, and make a little show out of it. And so I, I, photograph one of these guys and I said listen mate it's all right if I paint you and uh he was like yeah yeah absolutely and I said do you know are there any more guys like you and and he was like oh my god and so I then literally spent the next sort of six months going around the country finding all the most interesting looking guys and uh, and then painting them and creating my own show and so I had about 20 paintings to thereabouts and um I put this show on in a really cool East London bar and, uh, called Dream Bags Jaguar Shoes. Very cool place. Uh, in fact, Tarantino had his launch party for Kill Bill there in London. So it's a really very, very sort of cool little, little venue. And I invited all the barbers there and I got ended up getting like all these like um, goodie bags made up by all these different people, you know, who supply barbering products and things like that and had a drink sponsor and it became a really cool event. And, uh, and that attracted then uh, Clarendon Fine Art, the gallery that represents me. And uh, they saw this happen and, you know, this, this sold out, this show, every painting was gone. And uh, they then asked to, me to send a couple of paintings up to them. And uh, I said, well, look, they're all gone. You know, <laughs> you have to come down here and see them while they're here. And so they sent some people and uh, 
yeah, you know, the rest is, as they say, history. It, um, I started painting for that gallery in Mayfair and then solo show after solo show, sold out, each one selling out, selling out. And man, I'm just literally at the moment, I'm like touching wood every second thinking, I can't believe this is, you know, this is still going so well for me. You know, it's really been an absolutely crazy ride. And that was oh, nearly four years ago now, I think. So that, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Awesome. Wow, man. What, what a, um, what, what a story. What a fantastic kind of trajectory this has taken. It's quite, um, if you don't mind me asking, how, how old are you now? 44. 44. Okay. So you, you said you kind of kicked things off when your, um, when your son was born, you know, with this graphic novel yeah. that you were, you were writing. Uh, I, I'd love to hear yeah. more about that self-published comic book. And, and I'll tell you what, what strikes me about that story, and, and a lot of people sometimes, I get this sometimes, you know, they have the feeling that if they didn't start really, really young, then it's too yeah. late if they approach it. But it sounds like you were already an adult, you know, and, oh, and, yeah. you know, full functioning adult and, and with children yourself. And now you're making a go of it. So let, yes. let's yeah. before we get into that, I, I'd love to hear more about the the self-published comic book, what that was like and, and what the book was about and maybe where people yeah, could sure. find it now. So uh, that was 13 years ago. My boy Leo is, uh, well, it was more like sort of, uh, no, it's less than that. So it'd be like 10 years ago, because I think he started it when he was like three, when we first started looking at, at stuff. Um, well, a, a little bit more background really is I was working uh, for my parents at their company, uh, which is designing scientific instruments. I was just, you know, I went there for like three months stint when I was broke, you know, and I ended up staying and staying. Uh, and then my um, my mum, who was running the business, my dad's the designer, she, unfortunately, she died and there was no one to run the business and my dad was falling apart. So I stepped in to then run the business, not knowing anything about running a business really at all. You know, I was just a bit of a chancer. So I got loads of people in to help me understand. And this, this is relevant, don't worry, but I'm getting there. But yeah. I got lots of people in to help me understand how to run a business. You know, I got all kinds of consultants, marketing consultants, sales consultants, you know, people to do with finance, people to do with management training, to do with all these different things to help me in all these different fields and hire the right team around me to get the right people going. And, uh, and that actually quickly became quite successful. The business actually started doing really well as I realized that there's all this information out there. You know, you just need to have the balls to go for it, you know, and, and don't worry about it, you know, make mistakes, go and do it, go and do it. So it built this attitude in me that, you know, you, oh, if I can do that, blimey, I could do anything, you know. And so when I started like making this, this book, you know, people were like, don't be ridiculous, you know, what do you know about that? And I was like, well, you know what, there is so much information out there. So I just started like, downloading videos you know and courses on how to make co comic books reading you know there's a there's some fantastic books out there what's the one that i that was absolutely brilliant have i even got it lying around here by scott scott something or other it's all about storytelling you know he mm -hmm. tells you exactly how to create these books and stories and i had all the drawing skills and i've been writing stories forever so it it wasn't as difficult as everyone kept telling me it was going to be and so the book was called Leo the Robot Slayer. So my son is called Leo. Wow. So we started there and it was, a, it was a thing where Leo lived with his grandfather in this dystopian future where uh, the robots that his grandfather had designed had gone rogue and taken over the world. And they now lived in a, a, a sort of Terminator-esque world without all the carnage, you know, so much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but these robots were bad and there were still some good robots around. And anyway, Leo lived with his grandfather. And then eventually Leo was like, you know, we need to take back our, our world, you know. And so Leo's grandfather built another robot, uh, Benny, Benny Bing Bong, which was this other robot that would help him, which is Leo's younger brother. So he, Leo's younger brother came on the scene. And of course, he had to be in the story, right? He couldn't just have Leo in there. Yeah. So uh, I ended up uh, creating this comic book. It was like, I don't know, 50 odd pages, full color, uh, self-published it. Um, it then got taken up by a few comic books. Uh, it was in Waterstones, which is quite a big sort of um, chain of bookstores over here. So it was in some London comic book shops. And then I had a launch party where I actually built some giant robots out of fiberglass, which I again researched online, learned how to use fiberglass, sculpted them all out of polystyrene, first of all, coated them with resin, then coated them with 
glass fiber, painted them up. So we had like a 10 foot robot, eight foot, and I created Benny and Leo in fiberglass as well by sculpting out of clay. So I learned how to sculpt, which I really got into sculpture as well then. Mm. Um, and so the, the, this this thing got quite successful and it got some traction and it was on, you know, a whole load of these sort of um, blogs and whatever. And then I got contacted by one of these STEM things to go and talk about being a creative parent at the uh, the Royal Institute up in London and stuff and at the lectures. And I was like following Google and, being, and talking about creativity, which was just unbelievable, just based on this thing. So I think it was that was building this attitude of of confidence that, you know, if you can learn this, then you can learn that. And then there's nothing really beyond that scope of learning once you realize that it's just getting stuck in and, and going for it, you know. And so that's when the painting, I was like, well, look, this is what I always wanted to do. Maybe there's still a chance that I can become this artist. Mm. So I worked more and more on trying to being able to create more time for myself. So to, to become this artist, so I was painting at four o'clock in the morning, then going to work all day, then painting in the evenings. And just gradually building the skill set up to be good enough, you know, when everyone's telling you that you can't, if you didn't go to art college, if you didn't start when you were five, you know, if you didn't do this, this and this. Yeah. So, you know, the comic book really was just another notch to get the confidence into, um, into understanding that if you really want it, there's so many tools available out there now to, to build the skill set that you want to become you know, the person you want or to, to fulfill that dream that you want, you know, it's all there ready for you, you know? So that, that's really how it all came together. That's extraordinary. And people are going to be totally sick of me saying this, but it is so true that now today there, there's not been a better time to be an artist. There, there's never been a time like this uh, in terms of acquiring those little gaps or the, those little bits of information that fill in our gaps of understanding. Like, oh, I want to learn about fiberglass. Well, how many YouTube videos are going to come up now for free that you can just sit down and watch where they're going to tell you, you know, about resins and catalysts and pigments that you can color it with and your process put it over that don't put it over that you know it's extraordinary it's absolutely extraordinary but what i what i love about that that story um you know as you're telling it it kind of reminds me that you know people do still have in their minds this this set framework or trajectory i'm, I'm going to go to art school or i'm going I'm to be good at art i'm going to go to art school i'm going to go uh, from there get get into a gallery or get a grant or do this and, and there seems to be a set framework or a path and the more people i talk to the more i realize that every single story is different some people end up getting there in really strange ways but here like you took the bull by the horns. You're just like, I want to do this thing. So I'm just going to yeah. go for it. I'm just going to learn. I'm going to fill in the gaps. Awesome, man. That's so, that's so awesome. I look, I was kind of the same way when it came to YouTube. Um, and it, and it's always kind of funny when you, when you're running this by people, particularly well-meaning people that are in your family, people that love you and care about you and they don't want to see you fail, but they're like, Hey, you know what, maybe you shouldn't be doing that because you're not a filmmaker. So what do you know about putting together a YouTube video? I'm like, well, I'll, I'll figure it out. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. No, no, that's it. That's absolutely it. And once you've you've done it once, you know, you, obviously you, you fail a little bit to begin with. That's that's very important. You know, so you test your limits and you build and then you read around the subject and you go, OK, that didn't go quite so well. And you realize that failing is not a big deal, that no one actually really cares if you fail. No one's really paying that much attention to you. You know, yeah. it's like you're, you're completely able to fail, even quite publicly fail. And in fact, people quite like it if you fail a little bit and you, you know, you cock up a little bit and they see things going wrong for you. And and I think once you realize that, then then why wouldn't you just try and do you know, whatever it is that you want to do and have a go because that's that horrible thing that you don't want to end up you know as a as an old fella thinking oh man if only I'd given it a shot you know and it's uh, it's so important I made a film last year I had no business making a film you know it was a, a short film and got some really talented people involved and that's actually the key is going to people who already know loads about whatever it is that you want to do and just tapping them for that resource, you know, and saying, help me find out how to do this. Yeah. And th that's the way to do it. You know, stand on the shoulder of giants. That's, that's absolutely the way to go forwards, you know, in my opinion. I, I couldn't agree more. Look, seeing as, as, as you mentioned it, let's get into the film. Um, now, look, c correct me if I'm wrong. 
uh, but it seems when I look at your Instagram and, and knowing a little bit about the film now, it, it seems as though you made a film just so you could do these really badass paintings from the stills of the film. <laughs> but maybe I've got that completely wrong because I'm looking at all your work. It is fantastic. I mean, the lighting, the posing, the characters, like the narrative is coming alive just as like I'm scrolling through your feed and, and, and looking at these fabulous yeah. paintings. Tell me about the, this project. What gave you the idea for that? Tell me about the movie. So it's it's Queen of Diamonds. Is, it, is that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a poster. The, uh, All right, poster man. is back there. Okay. Um, well, you know what? I, I'll have to t tell you a little bit about the process because that's there's a little story behind behind mm. how this this film got made. So um, so generally for a series of so every year I have a couple of shows and um, you know I have to create a series of paintings whether that's sort of between fifteen to twenty to thirty paintings. And so the way that I found the easiest way for me to do that is to start by writing a complete story out, which I write as a screenplay because I'm not a brilliant wordsmith. And actually, I think much more in dialogue and scenes and, and cut twos and camera angles and so on. That seems to be the way that I see stories, you know, appearing as a, you know, more visual than, than, than text. So I write this screenplay out. And then I go around assembling cast and looking for shoot locations and things like that. And then, you know, get people in hair, makeup and all the rest of it, all the people you'd normally have for a big elaborate photo shoot and shoot all the reference and, and make the paintings, you know, from the reference. And we can go into more detail into that later on if you find that interesting. But the way that the uh, this film came about was that I... Um, uh, I had a show where I'd painted some, some jazz musicians and we had this really great show in the gallery. And this guy who's the um, the CEO of the Ritz Casino in London, right? The Ritz Hotel is like one of the flashiest, you know, historic hotels. And they have this casino where only like the super minted are. It's where they, where Shirley Bassey would go after the James Bond shoot. You know, it's a really flashy, decadent diamonds and crystals and gold leaf paintings, all the rest of it. Anyway, you just can't get in there, right? It's members only thing. And the guy who runs it came to my show and everything had been sold. And he said, uh, how do I go about getting an original? And I said, well, you can let me come and do a photo shoot at the Ritz Casino, just saying it as a laugh, you know? And he was like, okay, let's do it then. So I was like, oh, damn, nice. Wow. So I was like, quickly, I was like, okay, I need to come up with a good story. So I came up with a little diamond high story for the Ritz Casino. And I got a few, um, uh, actors for that that first shoot and I told uh, the guy Roger who is the manager there I said Roger why don't you be in in one of these paintings you know because what I wanted to do which I hadn't told him yet was I wanted to actually have the showing of the paintings in the Ritz Casino so uh, he agreed he said oh yeah yeah brilliant so I made him this character the Belgian who's who's ended up in the other film played by uh well I'll tell you later on but uh so Roger's in the paintings I paint everyone in it and we have this show in in December in the Ritz Casino, like the gallery built special walls to stand inside and um, with all beautiful lighting and all the rest of it. And it was just a small series of like six paintings, quite large, but anyway, just really good fun. I got a bit drunk and, you know, as it is, and you start talking with people and there were some film people there that I know, some directors and producers, and they were like saying, look, Vince, you're writing screenplays, you're doing shoots as though you're filming. Why on earth aren't you making a film? Hmm. And so I was like, oh, Mm, yeah, that's okay. That's like, how on earth do you go about doing that? So I said to this guy, Naeem Mahmood, who's made a few films, I was like, mate, can you, would you help me do this? You know, would you help me put a team together to make the film? And I'll ask Roger right now if we can actually film it here in the Ritz Casino. And so um, that's literally how it started. And Roger was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So uh, he ended up pulling out because the Barclay brothers who own the Ritz Casino two weeks before the shoot decided that they didn't like the idea of someone potentially being shot at the Ritz and the diamond thing. And they got all upset about it. And so they canceled the shoot two weeks before. But it meant that the PRs from the Ritz helped me find another location in Mayfair. We've got, we got another brilliant hotel, the Westbury, which is, you know, again, super decadent and really nice hotel. And um and so that's that's literally how the start how the film came because I had this script just started reworking it over and over working with lots of cool people. No, I've got a few friends in the film biz and they all helped me with it. And then to get the cast, 
uh, Tama Hassan, he's quite a well-known actor. He's been in a few gangster movies and stuff. He'd been to one of my previous shows and he said, hey, Vince, if you ever do anything again, I want to have something to do with it. Whatever it is, I don't care. So I was like, oh, fantastic. So I called Tamar up. I said, Tamar, I've written a short film. Do you want to be in it? He goes, send me the script, Vince, and I'll tell you. And so I sent it and he phoned me straight back. And he's like, I'm in, I'm in. So once I had Tamar on board, I then managed to get like Georgia Mayfoot. She's quite a well-known actress over here. Um, uh, Leo Gregory, who's another really well-known actor. He's been in lots of these gangster movies. Samuel Anderson, he was in Doctor Who. He's in a Netflix series at the moment, which is quite popular. That's gone into its second season. So I had this amazing bunch of people around me, which was just, uh, this is mind-blowing. You know, suddenly I've got this great cast. I've got all these brilliant people that Naeem had brought along, like cinematographers and lighting people and... You know, and I was just a chancer. I had no idea really what I was doing, but I had a very clear idea of what I wanted to see, you know, and see happen. And that's when I realized how difficult filmmaking is and how many compromises you have to make. And it's never quite what you think it's going to be. Mm. So, you know, and of course, I then had to pay for all this. So I had to make paintings. So that's when I said, right, I'm going to make stills from the film. And that's when I realized as well, ah, this is much trickier because normally with photo shoots and I'm sure you're the same, you want to move things around and all the rest of it. Yeah. And and when you're going from a still from a film, the composition just isn't right. There's too much negative space all over the place. And, and so the idea of creating uh, paintings from stills didn't really work in my opinion because I made them the same format as the screen mm -hmm. and I pushed things a little bit, but it just oh, it just wasn't quite what I wanted to do. I wanted to change lots more things, but I still wanted people to say, oh, that's that scene from, you know, in the film. Because we showed the film at uh, the Mayfair Hotel Cinema, which is where all the big movie companies come to screen for their VIPs. So it was up on a big screen, you know, and we had all of the VIP guests coming and it was like a really amazing night out. And so the paintings had to correspond to scenes from the film that everyone had then seen, you know. And uh, and consequently, it wasn't 100% success, in my opinion. Still good, but, you know, an amazing experience. I mean, if you judge it from experiential, you know, <laughs> success, it was amazing. You know, it was the best thing ever. So it was a steep learning curve, really. But. Uh, so, so the paintings. Uh, I'm, so, if I if I'm hearing this correctly, the paintings were then in that case. You're seeing the vision of the film as as your primary creative outlet. You're 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 kind of it's it's about making the film. The paintings are then secondary to the film. Yeah, right. There right. was this because there was a series already, right? Which we called. Um, so the first time that I. When I painted at the Ritz, you know, and I made that small series that I exhibited at the Ritz, mm -hmm. that we called that, oh, we, I called that Diamond Roulette, right? And that was the name of the, 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 the series of paintings. And we sold those series of paintings. So I'd already done it, you know, in a way with different actors. Then when I went to make the film, I, cut, I recast it because the, we had an opportunity to use some more well-known actors, you know, and... Uh, and then I thought, well, look, it costs money to make a film. I'll paint off the back of that and see how that works. And uh, I decided that actually it didn't work as well as shooting the, you know, the photos and then manipulating and changing. Because I draw everything out after I photographed. You know, I'm sure you do it. So many artists do it. The photograph isn't enough. You know, you have to do things. And uh, but in this instance with the film, I thought, okay, let's paint stills and but. It, I don't know. It worked. It definitely worked. I mean, I sold paintings, so it was good. But you know what? Yeah, right? I know what you're getting quite, at. I mean, it, it, the, the, for me, my paintings are um, are absolutely amazing. They're exquisite. My work is just the best ever up here before it's done. <laughs> the minute that you, yeah. you, you do it, you suddenly realize... Um, Oh my goodness! Uh, I, there's so many things I missed, so many opportunities I missed. I could do it so much better. And the older I get, the further I get down this road. The more and the more I mature in my artistic walk, uh, I I feel like that that's the essential part. That's the bit now that I'm addicted to. 
Um, and, and it's it's kind of interesting what you were saying before about failure. It's like I'm really looking forward to it now because I know that's where the growth is. That's where yeah. that's where the sweet spot is. Is if you screw something up, then it's going yeah. back and fixing that thing. And it's through the yeah. the act of fixing mistakes. And we're not talking like wholesale like real disasters. We're talking like little yeah. little things that are tweaks in your approach that, you know, make your product, make your painting, make whatever project you're working on better and better and better. Um, I think it's extraordinary. I, I love, I love the creativity that you're applying to each and everything that, that you've talked about so far. It seems like the way you're approaching this is a way a lot of entrepreneurs would approach any kind of business venture. And it's not that you have to be an expert in any given field. It's that, I want to do this thing. I wonder who knows a lot about this thing. Let me let mm. me team up with them. That's genius. I think that's that's absolutely extraordinary because a lot of people I think would also make the assumption uh, to their detriment that that I, it, it, whatever thing I'm going to do, whatever thing I'm going to apply myself to, I have to know everything about that. Not true. Oh. No, no, no. And actually, it's uh, it's impossible to know everything because you'd need to live several lifetimes to get as much information about each different thing. It's much better that you've got this, you, you know, you, you likened it to, you know, an entrepreneur who has an idea, right? He has a vision or she has a vision for what they want to achieve. And then what you then need to do is get all the people together to achieve the vision. That's the end goal, you know. Yeah. It, unless, of course, your end goal is just because you just want to be the person that does every little bit of it, you know, then that has to be a personal thing. But ultimately, if what you really want is what you see in your head, it's like, that's what I want to make. How am I going to make that? Well, I don't know enough to make what I see in my head. So yeah. I need to get all these other people involved. And that's actually an amazing journey in itself, getting hearing from all these people how they you know, apply their knowledge into creating these things. It's just, it's so much more fun, I think, than just being yourself up in your studio on your own, being a bit shit at all these other different things that you need to know about. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and, and I like the expression as well, standing on the shoulders of giants. I think when it comes to the art business, um, you know, that is absolutely vital. Uh, there there's so many people, and it's hard to have a big head about it these days. There's so many people out there that are just like blowing up, and they're massive, and it's so inspiring to see. And there's always mm. a little insight or something that you can garner from how they've done things. Um, you know, the day of being the, the the one man band and and doing everything yourself, I think is is you know it's over. I mean, in, in terms of even, you know, having to reinvent the wheel every time, you know, you can you can certainly gain that knowledge, especially, you know, especially today. That's um, yeah. I, I, there, there's one thing that is, is standing out. So while we're talking, I've, I've got your website up on the other monitor. I just want to change mm. tracks here for a second because I'm looking at your work and it's, it's really slick work. It's beautifully painted. Um, but. What, I, I, what I'm curious about is the time scale because there's a lot of paintings here and a lot kind of mm. that seems centered around this, say, just the Queen of Diamonds project. And I'm thinking to myself as I'm looking at this body of work, how quick is this guy painting? Like, <laughs> like how, 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 how long does it take you to make a painting? It's really well done, but there's so much work here that I'm like, whoa, you must be really churning them out. A am I right? Um, uh, got to be very careful with churning them out in case there are any clients, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, There's I know, no I know. Churning. No churning. Anyway. No, no. With all, with all due respect, of course. I, I, I uh, it, it's. Uh, I, I think that the no, you're time, right. You're right. You're right. I'm the churning time them and... out. I get it. So, <laughs> look, here's the thing. I um, you know, I think I mentioned to you before that uh, I'm. Uh, I'm also quite into my uh, physical fitness side of things and, you know, and working hard is important to me and I work long hours and I crack on, you know, and I'm, I feel like I'm pretty efficient, you know, in what I do and I don't start painting until I know what it is that I want to achieve, you know, what I want to paint. Uh, I think that's what enables me to paint uh, relatively quickly. Um, and so, you know, I mean, geez, it's, it's the, uh, the, 
the process that takes the most time is the coming up with the idea, you know, and then organize and writing the story, organizing the shoot, finding the right cast. That takes forever. Wow. The actual yeah. painting bit, you know, after a while, you get to a certain point in your sort of skill set where you can paint uh, pretty much what you want fairly quickly right I, mean, I know you're the same i've watched your amazing videos you know i know you also paint pretty damn quick you know you can get things done and then of course there's that last 10 percent where you could end up spending um an inordinate amount of time just getting those last little bits absolutely yeah. right you know yeah. and and that's something that i have managed to even though i struggle and hate the process of releasing a painting and thinking, surely that's not the best I can do. Please don't let that be the best I can do. I have to make peace with that's the best I can do to tell this story and to be able to make this work, you know, as I want to make it. Um, so I'm, I'm just, I'm super strict, man. I, you know, I get up at 5.30, I crack on, I'm in the studio by sort of 7.30, 8 o'clock and I work in 90 minute blocks and I'm blah, 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 blah. And I, and I crack on, I get things done, I make lists and I'm, Wow. And, uh, you know, it's it's a really um, it's, it's I know it's probably not cool and sexy and stuff, but it's pretty strategic in how I spend my time in, in creating the work. You know, I, I do see it as something of like I will, the storytelling part is probably the bit where I'm coming up with the ideas is probably my lot flouncy like, oh, let's get stoned. And, you know, uh, this one that could be good. But when I'm painting, I'm pretty much, you know, like whoosh, laser focused let's let's crack on let's let's get this done and okay. i have a great time doing it but i you know i'm definitely relatively quick i suppose wow so there's a lot of structure there's a lot of framework behind what you do i i can hear that so what i'm intrigued by, by something you said there which is the 90 minute blocks um what's mm. what's that about that's uh, did you ever read the book deep work Yes, it's I did. Good one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it talks about like finding, you know, mo where you can't really concentrate for any more than certain periods of time. And I think he he talks about maybe less shorter blocks. But mm -hmm. I found, and I worked on shorter blocks, but I kept getting interrupted, you know, and be like, oh, I'm actually I'm all right. And I found that 90 minutes I can go pretty deep for 90 minutes. But then definitely after that 90 minutes, I'm like, whoa, okay, right. 10 minute break. You know, and then I go back in again and 90 minutes. And I find that that's a really good amount of time to really do the best kind of work that that, uh, that I can do. And I'm enjoying myself. You know, I'm not like, like stressed for 90 minutes. I'm, I'm enjoying it and I'm getting stuck in and, and I love what I'm doing. But I find that 90 minute blocks works really well for me. Fantastic. And I think uh, that that book, if anybody's interested in checking it out, um, I got the audio version uh, through the Audible app. It's by Cal Newport, Deep Work. I highly recommend it as well. It's a really easy listen. Um, and there's a lot of strategies like that in that book that I found that were, were totally applicable to what what I was doing as well. I think everybody is, is, is quite individual. I think it's about finding that thing that works for you, but you seem to have found that thing that just clicks into place that allows you to produce at your best. And that's, yeah. I, again, I mean, I think that that's so vital that we find these strategies that allow us to stay at the easel or at, the, at our desk doing what we do best. And, um, you know, that's why I was such a fan of personal development for years and years is, is trying to find those strategies that would allow me to apply myself. Um, the, the, the other thing, though, that, that you mentioned there, which, of course, anybody listening to the podcast would know, I'm a massive fan of physical fitness as well, you know, taking care of the artist as a whole and having this holistic yeah. approach um, to your creativity. Can you tell us a little bit about your physical regimen and, and how you feel that feeds back into your creative pursuit? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I used to... Um... I used to race triathlon for years, you know, and I got quite into that uh, long distance triathlon racing, uh, Ironman racing particularly. And um, I found actually by lots of like testing in the same way that I do with anything really, uh, lots of reading, scientific papers, and then trying to find the most efficient way to do anything. So with my Ironman training, I did the same thing. I only did eight hours training a week and I got to a level where I qualified for the world championships three times. I didn't go, it's too expensive. But, um, you know, I got really fast 
in a relatively short amount of time, you know, in doing that. And I do the same with my physical training now because I'm painting for so many hours a day. Um, I find that uh, I first thing in the morning I have like a, a push up routine cause it just keeps the back and shoulders nice and strong. You know, having to stand up at the easel all day. I've got um, kettlebells knocking about here in the studio. And uh, after I've done my 90 minute blocks, I always go for very short little bursts of like, you know, 10 swings, then some push ups. And I've got chin ups here as well for like stretching my back out, uh, chins. Uh, then when I finish my lunchtime block, I I live right on the trails here, so I go out trail running. I hit trail loop here, um, and I've got a peloton bike in the studio, so I do a peloton class sometimes in the evenings. But I, every single day, I do some sort of uh, aerobic exercise that I just find that I can stand and paint longer when I'm physically fit. You know, I don't get pains in my shoulder, in my neck, in my hands, in my arms. And, you know, sometimes it's counterintuitive. People say, but if you're lifting weights and stuff, and how can you do it? I was like, it's by lifting weights and doing all that that I feel stronger and more buoyant and more energetic and enthusiastic to get into the studio. You know, I, I have that that pep that you need to go in and like beat yourself up sometimes when you're in front of that that painting. Mm. Uh, absolutely, I, I think that um, it's not only the um, you know the physical benefits of, of, of having a strong body to maintain a position in the studio so you can paint for hours and hours you know there's a lot of um, really interesting research that's pretty well founded now that you know that with your brain chemistry alone people that exercise people that get their blood flowing and really stress their body through some sort of resistance training it releases so many like so much endorphins in in, in your right. brain uh, that that you know that has a lasting effect through the day and and it's it's vital if I, I don't know if this rings true for you it does for me and maybe a bit of a sensitive subject for many folks but you know this whole issue with mental health there are so many artists that i've spoken to that have their their little battle with with some form of mental health issue and, mm. and I, maybe it's not talked about enough today, but I think one of those things that has been vital for me is that physical exercise component. It's just getting in the oh, gym and, and, and doing it. And it's almost like you don't give your, yourself an opportunity to be down. And it doesn't, it doesn't mean you're not going to experience problems and go through sad times or depressing times in your life. Of course you will. But I think we're a lot more resilient as a result of, of doing some sort of physical exercise. Oh, there's no doubt. There's no doubt that I would have lost my mind, God knows how many times over, if I hadn't, you know, if I don't hit, get outside, if I don't hit those trails, if I don't, uh, you know, I mean, the the few kettlebell swings and stuff is good for my shoulders and whatever else I'm doing it. But I tell you what, it's the for me, it's the hitting the trails, it's the hitting, getting on my bike and then, you know, going out and just drilling it for like an hour or so and just getting into that, that complete different mind state mm. that I'm then buzzing again and I'm ready to go right at it again. I have to get away in order to come back and be everything that I can be in the studio. Wow. And so how um, how important is, is routine? It seems like you've got like a set time at which you do things as well. Is that something that you're finding feeds directly back into the, the painting and the creative side as well? Yeah, I do, man. I do. Absolutely. Have you ever read um, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield? It's next on my audible list here. <laughs> uh, yeah. So The War of Art and Do the Work by Stephen Pressfield. Mm -hmm. um, I've got like about maybe 10, 15 copies in the house. Every time someone who comes to the studio or whatever else, a young artist starts whining about not being able to make it and la 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 and I can't do this and do that. I give them a copy of this book because it's the kick in the ass that a lot of people need, I think. I think that it's not glamorous to have a routine and, and to treat it like a job, but I tell you what, Stephen Pressfield, he's the one really that sort of reinforced to me that you need to, you know, the muse has to find you at work, right? It's uh, getting there in the morning. You don't feel like painting every day. You know, it sucks a lot of the time. It really does. But that everything is like that. Yeah. With the highs, there are the lows. And so I found that if I show up every day and I work, some days are amazing. Some days I really fly. But I have to get in there and do it. And, you know, I always do my painting first thing, right? All the other BS, emailing, trying to sort stuff out, organizing photo shoots, dealing with actors who suddenly 
flipping, you know, let you down at the last second. All that crap has to happen later in the day. The, the start of the day, I get my painting done. And for me, it's got to be at least six hours. Maybe that doesn't sound like a lot, you know, but it's six hours of deep, you know, concentration work. And it's at least, so I, I will go on, but I try to limit it to that so that I then can, because it's every day, right? I'm sure you've got tons of admin, probably more than me, you know, with all the you know, the wonderful videos that you're making and everything. Loads. But it's it's really, it's that last part of the day for me that, that I have to deal with that grind work, you know, that's, uh, and I, ha I have to have that routine, man. It's the only way that, otherwise, you know, you procrastinate, right? You're like, what am I gonna do today? Uh, you know, and you can, you can ask about and waste so much time if you don't have clear intention for the day. Absolutely, like things that the minutia ends up taking you over if you don't have a set intent, if you don't, if you don't state, hey, this is my direction, this is my purpose, and I, I yeah, it, it's it's essential for me as well. I, I'm I'm now in the process where I'm playing with different routines. I'm trying to, you know, after going through Cal Newport's book and and a few others that I've I've really been enjoying, I'm trying to work out what is that thing that fits my own patterns the best it used to be waking up yeah. like at 4 30 in the morning and and uh you know getting sketch time and going to the gym every evening but you know prioritizing as well like i love what you're saying about get your painting done first you know for me mm. you know there's there's essential daily sketching time painting time and then of course yes loads of admin but the days where i don't have it either written down or have that pattern in place the minutia will always end up filling bigger and bigger gaps and blocks of time. And then yeah. it ends up being eight at night. And it's like, I didn't even paint. What, what happened? I was, I was stuck on that yeah. one thing all day and, or, or yeah. stuck on that group of tasks that wasn't really even related. It was like being on hold to the power company because the studio or whatever, you know, just yeah. little yeah. things, they end up eating away at you. And I think, I think having a clear intention is, is absolutely vital. Um, no, I love it, man. I absolutely love it. So, man, lo lots of stuff here that uh, that that I, I want to ask you about. Um, uh, can we can we go back to to the Queen of Diamonds, if if you, if you don't sure. mind? I want to want to ask you a absolutely. bit more about this. So, it, initially, it, it sounds like. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about how you would have made this movie and pulled this off. Now, of course, he had these sellout shows. So, you're, if you don't mind me, may, you know, saying you seem to be doing really well as an artist. You know, you're selling lots of work. You know, you, you're probably making a really decent income out of that. Do you have then, in order to to, I, I'm, I'm just thinking about this film project. Going, man, you've got to bite off such a chunk financially to just pull that thing off. You got your director, you got all your actors, you got location. So, how are you balancing between calling in all these favors and just managing that, or, or is it all ba banking on, nah, on the fact surprised. that maybe you'll you'll sell a painting at the end of it? You know, yeah, I'd nah, be surprised actually. Yeah. It's it's um. Making short films, there are so many people in London and you know the big cities that are so desperate to, to make it in the film world that loads of people want to work for little or no money. And so, um, so f first of all, like I produced, I directed, I wrote. So that already were some some big things right there. Wow. Then the cinematographer, highly experienced guy, worked completely free. You know, all the wow. gaffers, you know, lighting people work for free. So I then rented like the lenses, the camera, the lighting for really quite a low cost because he managed to rent it through rent it for me through the company, the advertising company he works for. So there's little things like like the Westbury Hotel gave me the location, the shoot location free. They gave me a suite for free. Then gave me like a second suite for hair and makeup and stuff for like half rent, uh, half price. You know, in central London, it's just mental, those sorts of costs. All the extras free, the key cast members all worked for me just doing them a painting. So, you know, I just did them a little head study sort of painting. They were all just so excited to get that. I couldn't believe it. These top actors, you know, that come on big fees, Got a got a painting out of it, and they were they were amazing. You know, they worked long hours, really long hours, no complaints, just brilliant. And and everyone involved was like that. It's the industry, the film industry is amazing. It's like it's got to be pretty much unique for the amount of people that work for little or no money, just because they love being part of it, and for the potential of something in the future. You know, coming from it. 
madness. Italian. See, again, I mean, we're talking about these these mindsets and trying not to limit yourself from the outset. And there, that, that was probably an example of my limited kind of mindset thinking about your film project going, how on earth would you even pull that off? But here, you, yeah. you're, you're creatively going around seeing how many things you can pull together, pulling resources yeah. and networking, essentially, uh, to, to do that. Extraordinary, man. Like, that's that's so awesome. That's so awesome. Like, <laughs> Thanks, man. There's just lots of asking. You know, you you don't if you don't ask, you don't get. You know, the, the, me getting Roger first of all from the Savoy, uh, Savoy from the that's another project I'm working on with the Savoy, another cool thing. But anyway, um, getting Roger to let me use the Ritz for the photo shoot. It was just me asking, just a cheeky question. You know, he wanted to buy a painting. They were all sold. He was too late to the show, and he said, "How do I go about getting one?" I said, "Well, the only way, Roger, is if you let me shoot at the at the Ritz." And so that led to another thing and to another thing. So it wasn't like I had some grand plan of making this film. It was just little opportunities coming along going, oh, that looks good, that looks interesting. Let me go on that, let me go on that. Then it's a few drinks at the Ritz and you know, I'm standing there with a screenplay and someone's like, why aren't you making a film? I'm like, yeah, make a film, all right, that sounds cool. <laughs> Let's see how we can do that, you know? Because if I went around starting to try and figure out how much it would cost, and I spoke to a film producer after I'd already started the ball rolling and I'd gone behind point of no return. She was like, and you know, what about your budget for parking costs for like crew? And what about your lunch costs for this, that, and the other? I said, if I'd have charted all of that in an Excel spreadsheet, the project would never have got off the ground. You know, it's- That, that right there, yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, and that would have just killed it dead in its tracks, wouldn't it? Yeah. Absolutely, it would have. It would have been impossible. And also, right, my show was like, uh, what was it, like the 5th of December, I think, the Ritz show was. From the 5th of December, the film was uh, written, cast, shot, uh, color graded, you know, everything, edited the whole thing by April. Apparently, it's some sort of record. It's like never been done, like in that sort of time before, because I'm just like, bang, 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 right, who's doing what? Let's do that. Let's go, 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 go. And that's, you know, it's really just because everyone says, no, that's not how things are done. I'm like, ah, let's, why are things not done like that? We can do that. Yeah. So I called in a lot of favors. My mate, um, Mike Scrag, he's got this amazing post-production company. In fact, his color grader is the guy who did um, Peaky Blinders and The Revenant and things like that. So I had like top people working on the color grades and I sat in with them, you know, and saw how it was all done. And we had a great editor, you know, and another mate did the composition and musical score. And, you know, just this, that's the other advantage of being like in my 40s. I've just got all these mates now who are all started at the same time, who've all got, you know, further up in the business and know other people and all of that sort of thing. Hmm. So it, I'm not saying that it's, uh, it's easy to do what I've done, but it definitely helps when you're tapped into a, a network that you've been crafting all these years, you know, and finally you can actually say, oh, wow, come on, let's, let's make this, let's do this. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> I love it. So you mentioned something about the Savoy and that being your next project. Uh, so what, yeah, I was going to ask you what, what is next down the pipeline for you? What's, what are the next big things you're working on? Oh God. So, um, I've just finished painting my show uh, for April 23rd. Mm -hmm. Um, so of course you're invited, mate. I know it's a long trek, but for this, out this there. year, yeah, yeah, April 23rd. So I've just finished painting for that. So there's been 28 paintings for that. Wow. Uh, and that's called Max and Misha. And I wrote this screenplay about a, um, a it's a, a Russian girl that's coming to avenge her sister who was working for this Russian mob uh, in the city. And there's this like ex-British military guy who's like a fixer for them who ends up helping her. And anyway, oh, carnage. And there's like... Um, there's like this kingpin character who has like these samurai girl security force and I've got the samurai here. This is, you know, I've got these real <laughs> photo shoot and awesome. what else have we got here? Have we got? And there was guns involved and there was, there was all sorts of things. Oh, look, there's a, there's another sword there. Okay. So uh, there was, that was a really big crazy shoot that we did uh, in, in June, and I've just finished then painting for that show. 
and they escape in this 1965 Ford Mustang, which is my car. And so my car is going to be in the gallery for the show. So people will come in and all the cast uh, will be there in the same costumes from the shoot and in the paintings and the car will be in the gallery. And uh, so that show will be on for uh, a couple of weeks. Um, So that's what's just happened. And what I'm now working on is actually, this is not necessarily a, sort of i don't know how this is going to work but again it's another punt i mentioned you know how much i love rembrandt right and there's a painting uh that rembrandt has done called the um the anatomy lesson of uh, dr nicholas tulip and i'm sure you know it it's yeah, the, yeah. the cadaver on the table you know with the uh, the doctor over there and all the students looking at it and so i thought i'm going to revisit my uh, my contacts in the barbering world because of course barbers used to be surgeons you know before they were officially official surgeons so you've got like the institute of barber surgeons in london so i thought okay i'm going to recreate this rembrandt painting you know and there's a good i don't know how many maybe 15 people in it but i'm going to use these barbers so it'll be a shaving lesson rather than an anatomy lesson so we've got one guy in a chair prone in the chair and then we've got this famous barber that i know who's then standing there with the scalpel you know ready to do the shave and then all the other barbers are all leaning in 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 the same sort of pose as in this rembrandt painting so it's a it'll be a pretty big sort of two meter painting lots of people and i'll do lots of studies for that and it'll just be like a Mm one-off you know painting so that will um When's that? When will I start that? I think I'll start that in about a month time. But I've got I'm in a show in New York in June. So I've got to do a one off painting for that. So I'm shooting for that on the what day are we today? So I'm, I'm shooting yeah, on Thursday this week, coming week for that, where I've got like four characters. But it's just a one off shoot. And I've written a little story for that. So I'm going to shoot that in London at this old dive pub. It's an amazing place. And uh and these are really well-known actors as well, so it'll be really quite good fun. And um, and what else? Oh, and the Savoy is towards the end of the year. Mm-hmm. I shot this amazing jazz singer called Judy Jackson. She's so cool, amazing, amazing, like the kind of person that blows the roof off. Very young, I think she's like 24, wow. but she's gonna be like she's gonna be amazing. And she's the resident um, artist at the Savoy Hotel in London, the amazing hotel. Mm-hmm. And I went to see her there in, in December. I did some a little bit of a shoot, and we're going to do a show together where she does a, a set at the Dover Street Arts Club, which is like on the same street as my gallery. And then all the punters will see us sing, and then come to the gallery. So that might be in December. So lots, lots. Awesome, man. You know, there there is a, there is a chance that I might be able to make your opening. No way! There is a chance, there's a slight chance. This painting behind me, um, nearly finished, is being delivered to its client in London. Oh! Yeah, and uh, he wants it it this April, so, um, yeah. Come on! (laughs) So it might line up, man. Listen, I'd love to go, I'd love to go, but uh, we'll we'll see, we'll see what happens, we'll see what happens. 23rd of April. 23rd 23rd of April, April. brilliant. And what was the name of the gallery that it's been shown in? It's called Clarendon Fine Art. Clarendon Fine Art, excellent. Take note, and if anybody listening is in, uh, is in the London area, or, you know, around the UK and they can make it down, I, you know, go and see Vince's work. Extraordinary stuff. Please excuse this short interruption. I want to take a quick minute and just let you know that if you're not already subscribed through my website at andrewtischler.com, you could be missing out. Now, why on earth would you want to subscribe? Well, I got a couple of reasons for you. Number one, you're gonna get access to my YouTube videos 24 hours before I make them live, which gives us a chance to interact in that comment section. And reason number two is whenever I release a full tutorial, you're gonna get a nice discount or a freebie. Now I always look after my subscribers and it costs you absolutely nothing to subscribe. So I've got a big tutorial about to drop. And with that, I've got the Epic Milford tutorial, eight hours of landscape painting goodness. And when my subscribers get their hands on that tutorial, they're gonna get the Epic Kimberly tutorial absolutely free of charge. Now, to subscribe costs you nothing. All you gotta do is go over to my website, andrewtischler.com slash subscribe, chuck in your name, your email address there, and you're good to go. So I hope to see you soon over there. Remember, subscribe through my website, not just here on YouTube, but through my website. Now, let's get back to our podcast with Vince Camp. 
um, I, I love, I love, I've loved talking to you so far and, and hearing about all these different things that you're working on. It's, it's just incredible. Um, I do have a lot of uh, people listening to the podcast who are just starting out that are, you know, regardless of whatever age they are, they want to jump into their creative journey and they want to really make a good go of it. And so it seems that you've got and, uh, and had over your career so far the opportunity to interact with a lot of younger people what what is some of the mm. advice and, and and you know some pointers that you would offer to people who were just starting out on their creative journey well yeah this is a this is the fundamental thing that that i've noticed that i get asked quite a bit is that um you know artists get to a certain level where they think that their work is is good enough and it and it often is you know there are loads of amazing brilliant artists better than me you know uh, painting beautifully the figure they've gone and studied at the Florence Academy or whatever and they can create stunning works of art really beautiful but they aren't necessarily selling and they get frustrated they think their work is great and why aren't they getting however many likes and why aren't they selling and why are the galleries not interested and one of the key things that I noticed is that they're not delivering a package you know, that that a gallery can sell. And okay, you don't have to sell through galleries, of course not, you know, there's lots of ways you can sell nowadays, especially with social media and all the rest of it. However, if your intention is to sell to a gallery or even on social media, you've gotta be the guy or girl that, you know, does this one thing, right, really, really well, right? So that people get to know you for a certain type of, of work that they can expect there's more coming. Because if you sell one type of work and then all these other people wanted that same piece of work and then the next piece is nothing like it or is a completely different thing. You're painting dogs one day and then the next day you're painting cars and you can't build up any kind of audience or collectors of a type of work that you're doing. So I keep saying, find something that you really love. Now, whether it's storytelling in some way or it's like a certain you know uh, genre that you're going for try and find one thing that you feel that you can really get amongst and don't skip about trying to do loads and loads of different things and then getting frustrated because you will get frustrated because there can only ever be one customer for that one painting but if they know oh he's going to be painting this series of beautiful landscapes like the amazing work that you do you know you see these amazing landscapes and can you imagine if next week you weren't doing that you know they'll be like but i want that and you're like well i'm not going to reproduce that you know but i'll do another one that's in that vein and with that same inspiring look and all the rest of it and i think that's what some people really miss out on so that's the first thing that i say get get something that you can really get stuck into the next thing is Go to art fairs and learn how to talk about your work to people. Learn how to get rejected by people how, as they walk past and just sort of like go, Ugh, I don't like that or whatever. Learn to like, ask them, what do you like about this? What do you like about that, you know, that I've done? And try and engage and talk to people about what you're doing. Because I did loads of art fairs and it really helps, you know, to to have people talk to you and tell them and, and they say to you well you know I don't like this I like that I like what you've done this and there and each time you just get a little bit more used to being rejected a little bit more used to someone not really digging or getting what you are doing and you start understanding more what people do want you know you start understanding your audience a little bit more about what do they really get and it's not that you're then painting to a specific customer's want, but you just start learning just little bits of like, well, what don't they like? You know, what? maybe it's the size. You know, people have small apartments and you're painting giant paintings that it just simply doesn't fit. And you just never really understand that from a little Instagram posting. You know, no, no one really knows what size the thing is or what it even looks like on the wall. Uh, you know, that's the danger with Instagram a little bit, trying to just sell through Instagram. I mean, I, I can't imagine what it must be like for you when you paint these beautiful landscapes and someone sees it on this tiny little screen. I mean, you must be like, what? Have you got any idea what it's like to stand in front of this, to feel like you're tipping over the cliff into this gorge? It's, it must drive you insane. And I think that's one of the key things for people to show your work in the real world, you know, get real life people to look at it and understand what it is, see the texture and the brush strokes. And, and then third is the routine. Get a routine, get a way of doing it. If you've got a day job, 
make sure you carve out whether you're a morning person or a night person have a specific time that you paint and be really strict about it have a clear intention of what you want to achieve in that time and just get the work done because there's just so much work to be done do you ever get people telling you oh look i, I just i just don't have time there there's only so many hours in the day and i just don't have time what do you say to those people oh it's it's really hard not to get um not angry but frustrated i think really when when people say that because i i've got family two children and you know i was working a proper job with like 40 odd employees uh and working all day and then painting at night and then or painting first thing in the morning four o'clock in the morning and being absolutely exhausted and if you haven't got time then you just probably just don't really want it enough you just probably don't because there probably is time i found time it was hard and it was really tough at times to you know keep everybody happy and there were definite problems and you know we struggled and i didn't see friends for a long time and all of that but i think you've got to ask yourself you know how much you want it because you can always find time you know be organized i do you mind um Vince, if if we we talk a little bit about um, finances without going into too much detail or anything like that, but again, I I believe as an artist that taking care of the business side of things and having control of your money and your income and actually having a sensible routine or regimen around finances. I mean, you've got to look after your time. You've got to be disciplined there. You've got to look after, you know, your, 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 so your routine. You, you've got to look after your physical health and have discipline there. But one of the other places that I think people are really missing some, some knowledge and some really good sound habits is around the financial side as well, because I've known of so many artists that just couldn't get it together. And here you yeah. seem to be making this work as like a, a, a business. I, I'm wondering, you know, what are some of the strategies that you have there? For, for me, it's all about diversification. You know, of, yeah. of any painting, I'm making several streams of income just off one painting. And yeah. working that out has taken a number of years. But now it's at the point where if I just had to sell paintings, I would have gone out of business back in 2015, 2016. And, and I wouldn't have been able to make this work. Um, it's not to say that that is the case with everybody, but, but what are some of the strategies that you have in place just to make sure you stay afloat, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, um, well, actually, that, that diversification that you're talking about, I am um, not the complete opposite, but I do rely on the sale of paintings. Um, I... I've chosen because of the uh, relationship I have with my gallery uh, that it's it's almost like a sort of a record label sort of relationship in a way you know um, uh, they they sell my product very effectively they have got a huge network of galleries all around the country um, and they sell limited edition prints of some of my work you know as well so the best thing that I could do the most effective use of my time is to produce paintings you know that is something that uh, and that is why I try my very best to make sure that everything I'm doing is to the means of producing the painting if there's anything that someone else could be doing I try and outsource that work so for instance I have quite expensive accountants who handle everything financial for me so that I'm not spending time doing all my taxes you know figuring all that sort of stuff out paying my you know VAT back and all that all those different things um, I try and like minimize all of those things like I found a really good um, company that makes my canvases bespoke sizes you know and, and whatever I want to use and so on so I don't have to do any of the stretching and all that I make sure they do all the priming for me you know so that it's like minimal work when they turn up at the studio it's you know maybe sanding once and one more coat of primer and that's it you know I don't have to go in deep on that sort of thing so really for me it, it's it's the focus is on what can I be doing for the next series of paintings how can I organize the next show to have as big a bang as the last one, you know, so that I can make as much as possible from that show. And, you know, what, what is it going to be that enables me to sell as many paintings as possible? Um, trying to, 
uh, sort of diversify from each painting uh, hasn't really uh, worked for me. I haven't, you know, I haven't got a huge social media following that I can sell to, and I can't anyway. I'm contractually bound to the, everything has to go through the gallery, uh, and I'm just not very good at the social media thing. You know, I, I find it frustrating. I'm just you know, I don't want to build my um, success just on on how many clicks I get. You know, on a, on a painting, of course. Uh, so, so that I, I know that works really well for lots of people. You know, um, I think that for work that is more um, sort of figurative uh, and landscape, like the detail of the work, I would be surprised if you sold a massive beautiful piece like that behind you through uh an, an instagram thing i i would you know i'd find that it's shocking never someone it's never happened no I, I can't yeah. exactly I, i've only I had mean. one sale that came through any means of social media uh it was there was only ever been one um and yeah. it was uh, and it turned out to be a fantastic client but it was his wife who was looking at uh, some of my tutorials because she was interested in learning how to paint. And then he saw right. the painting in the video and, and then saw it on Facebook. And he's like, actually, I really like that. And then, you know, he got in touch and, and I made the sale from there. And then he commissioned a, a massive one. But it's only, it's only ever been one. I couldn't, I couldn't form a business around it. No. And I think there's a certain type of artwork that does sell well, perhaps, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say, but, you know, there is a certain type of artwork that does sell very well through um, through Instagram. Uh, mine isn't like that. So that's why I have to really nurture the relationship I have with the gallery. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I treat that as, as my distributor. I'm the manufacturer. They're my distributor. I want to make sure that my distributor has everything that they need in order to sell my work. So I will volunteer to go and give like sales talks to um, gallery staff, you know, so they'll get a bunch of the gallery people together and I'll go and talk to them about, you know, uh, a series of paintings that I'm making and what's the process and what goes into it all so that they've got little bits of information to tell their customers when they come into the gallery and I'll um, you know I'll do anything I can so if they've got a customer who's umming and ahhing a little bit I say hey look why don't you why don't you give them my number or something and I'll I'll talk to them you know or I'll come and meet them at the gallery and we'll talk together and we'll get a coffee and I'll tell them all the stories and I'll all that you know that skill talking about work that I talked about that you learn at art fairs and what have you, you then put that into practice, talking to the, the customer, making them understand what it was that drove you to make that painting and about you know why it's special. Because when they meet you, then they're suddenly they've, oh, I met the artist and this and that. And it all just, it all helps. So for me, the finances is based on nurturing the relationship with the gallery because they're my, they're my sales force mm -hmm. in a way. So mm -hmm. that, that's what I really focus on, trying to give them everything they need to, to sell my work. That's extraordinary. You you don't often hear of of people or of a gallery in that circumstance. And and this might be the benefit of having that contract and that really good understanding and relationship with your with your representative. But often the galleries will fiercely maintain that middle ground between you and the client. And and they won't you you, you won't will never meet the people that are buying the painting. But it seems like you've got a really great understanding there where that it, that is something that aids the process of, of making the sale, oh, God, which yeah. is fantastic. I, I found that to be essential. There was one gallery and he was, um, <clears throat> he was a guest for episode, um, uh, episode 12, I think it was Colin Dixon, a uh, dear old friend of mine. Um, an, an amazing guy, beautiful guy, uh, he sold my work for over 12 years. Um, a, and and he would he would essentially you know if he had a client and I, I was just down the road he would call me up and he'd say Andrew I've got somebody in the gallery nibbling at this painting they're they're thinking about it why don't you come down and tell them all about it you know and, and yeah. that, that was wonderful the only he was the only example I ever had in my career of somebody that was willing to do that. The, that's you know, so bizarre isn't it weird yeah and i that's think so i think there are weird. a lot of galleries that are doing that as well that that just that just fiercely maintain that middle ground and they don't see the opportunity in there and also maybe it's also on the fault of the artist maybe a lot of us just don't even think to ask 
Yeah, I do think that. I think a lot of artists just want to stay in the studio and they maybe don't want to get out there and be yeah. present at the show and talk to the customers, you know, and say, yeah. you know, because they maybe feel it's a bit cheap or something like that. I don't know about like actually selling, but that's yeah. how we make our living, you know, is selling paintings. You can't yeah. just paint. You do need to do a little bit of sales work as well. And uh, people think it's gross or whatever to do, but it's not. It's wonderful because they are helping you do this thing that you love these people that buy yes, your work absolutely and to yeah. and to meet them and know about them and know where the painting's going to hang and and all these sorts of things yeah. that's a privilege man it's it's really it's wonderful sure. to meet the punters that buy the work yeah. and so i i love it anytime and in fact some of the people that have bought my work they're just the most lovely people ever and i know all about their families and all sorts of things about them you know and it's a really nice relationship because they've invested significantly in the work you know and it's, uh, it's, sure. it's, a, it's a really wonderful thing. You know, it, it, I think it's time that we, we do shed this idea that it, there's something wrong with selling. There's something wrong with being commercial if you're an artist. If you hold on to that idea that you're not a real artist if you don't sell, uh, you're, you're not, you're, or if you, if you do sell, you're not a real artist, I think it's time that that we, we put that one to bed because uh, I it's so destructive, but also it's just, it's a myth. Where did we even get that from? With this notion of the starving artist and that somehow has you know, more merit to it than, than uh, getting out there and being commercial. To me, you know, a lot like what you're saying, I, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to sell to people and, and I have genuine love and affection for these people. I'm just like, wow, thank you so much. I'm so grateful mm -hmm. that you're allowing me to continue to do what I love to do and continue yeah. to explore this thing that I feel is my God-given purpose here on this planet. This is what I'm here to do. Thank you for, for yeah. you know, facilitating that. Thank you for making that possible. Amazing. But, you know. I think it's a trust thing, man. I think it's, yeah. a, like, it's, a, it's the gallery has to trust you to not go and try and sell behind their backs, you know. And, yeah. you know, and that's why if, if you have that relationship with them, then, you know, just talking to those letting the gallery do what they do best, which is handle the sale. You know, they do all the framing for me. They come and pick up the work from my studio. Uh, like I know all the drivers. I know all the people who work in the galleries. You know, it's, it's, it's a really good relationship that I have with them, you know, and awesome. I'm happy to stay with them. And of course they take a big chunk of the, the prize, but it's <laughs> that to me, that's the price that you pay for it. It's yeah. it just in my situation, right? It, works for me and so that's why i'm invested fully in that relationship you know and uh, right. and i totally get that some people don't want to have that but i think that maybe pursuing that kind of relationship is 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 worth thinking about yeah you're absolutely right yeah i i, I the more artists that i talk to the more i i'm starting to kind of come around a little bit to this idea that uh you know, maybe I never say never. Maybe I will explore this for myself. Uh, I, I'm now self-represented totally. Um, I do have I, actually when I say that I do have one gallery still in Perth in Western Australia that uh, that I'm, I'm thinking about dealing with on, on a more kind of medium to long term basis. And they've they've been able to move some work. But for the most part, like I, I'm, I'm talking to you now from my studio on the other side of that wall is my gallery. Um, right. And so and that, that's been fun, kind of running, running my own show. But um, the online stuff has just kept me so busy that uh, I haven't had that's... much of a chance to, to branch out. But you're inspiring me, dude. I, I, I think, well, you know? that's, I, that's what I was interested actually to ask you is like yeah. how what, doing all these other things, like making the tutorials, which are wonderful, really good. And, and mm. you know, all of that sort of stuff, that's obviously mm. taking away from the painting side of things so do you see all the, the podcasting and tutorials and videos and stuff is that something that you just do because out of enjoyment or what is it that, that you really find the the real is, is there another benefit something else that, that you're doing it for I, I found that I, I, the, my online journey and, and my artistic journey for the past four to five years has I, I've really been discovering a lot about myself um, and okay. I, I originally thought uh, I am just a painter and I paint in my studio and that was it. Um, mm -hmm. Now there's this wonderful kind of feedback mechanism that's happening between you know, myself and people that are following me online where I just, I love to teach and I love to share. 
and and I, I love I, I love the I love kind of learning new techniques, uh, developing as an artist, gathering more information, and then passing that on. And to me, what what gets me, and really fires me up to and gets me out of bed in the morning, essentially, is like when I get an email from somebody saying, I I haven't painted in thirty years. I watched your video and I went out and I bought some brushes and some paints and now I'm going to have a crack. I'm going to give it a go. I'm like, wow, oh, man. And, and I, to me, I'm addicted to that now. So that has really has taken over. Now, of course, in order to be able to do that and to have that kind of relationship with, with people all over the world, uh, I have to be producing paintings. The interesting yeah. thing is, though, since starting and running this as an online business, I've now, the, 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 the end goal has changed from producing a product that sells through a gallery to now producing a painting for a lesson. And now it's changed the question for me. It's like, not what can I paint that I think will sell? It's what do I really want to paint? And, and now my relationship to my work has changed where a lot of the work that I'm painting now, uh, I'm actually keeping a lot of that work. I've never had that relationship with my work before. Like most of the time when I'd finish something, it'd be like, you know what? It's time to shed this. I, I just, I get it out of here. I don't want to see it again. Yeah, um, yeah, tell me but, about it. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's not that I, I think the paintings that I've done are perfect, far from it. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I would do differently if I had the opportunity to do it again. But now I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to fix that on the next painting. I'm going to fix that on the yeah, next yeah. painting. It has, totally. it has really totally changed the, the direction of my business, uh, you know, if, if I'm completely honest. And, and I, I do love this new direction. It just seems to jive with my personality. And it's weird, mm. you know, being, being an artist nowadays, I mean, and I think it's always been a lonely pursuit, you know, exploring your creativity, toiling, you know, away, just the graft of just, just putting in the, the hard yards in the studio. Uh, no one's there while you're doing that. Um, yeah. But then the minute you put a video up on YouTube or you make a post on Instagram or you, you share something on Facebook or I put out an email to my subscriber list, now suddenly that feedback just starts pouring back in. And it's not a question of being addicted to the praise. What I'm addicted to and the bit that I really uh, love is hearing that I've helped in some way. That's, that's the yeah. thing that gets me, that I've, that I've inspired somebody, that I've motivated somebody, or maybe I gave them a little insight that they, they haven't heard it put quite that way before, and now they understand tone or color or composition or whatever, yeah. you know? No, no, it's amazing. I mean, I, uh, you know, I very much enjoy your, your videos, uh, especially like the last one, watching the, the, you know, the gorge, the, the building up and also using, you know, the whack on because I do the same thing, man, my process. I, I've got this thing that I'm talking to you right now, this Microsoft Surface Studio, which is just game changing because I had the big whack on before, which I did my comic book on was on a, a on a whack on uh, awesome. screen. Uh, rather, I started on the, uh, the the desktop tablet, you know, like I think you were using, and then I eventually managed to get a secondhand big whack on screen that you can, you know, draw directly onto the screen, which was awesome. just pff, total game changer. You can just do so much so quickly. Mm. But then those tutorials, I still am watching tutorials all the time. I'm watching a load of tutorials on 3D, building up uh, 3D uh, environments, like awesome. so that I can shoot actors. In a, in a basic studio and then completely construct a 3D because quite often my shoot locations fall through the last minute or uh, mm -hmm. they're not quite right. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, okay, so now I'm learning how to do that, you know, and then, and then in Photoshop paint those, those environments where, they, where they're in. Uh, it just means I'm not as dependent. You know, I can go and shoot the location, for instance, without the actors and then just rebuild it in, in 3D and, uh, and then manipulate it around depending on where I want my horizons and that sort of thing. Awesome. So I'm always looking for new things as well. And these tutorials and, you know, I'll watch every now and again, I'll watch a, uh, you know, a charcoal tutorial and see if there's a different technique there. And I'll, then I'll watch a different one on someone who's painting with um, palette knives or whatever. And you're just like always thinking, oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. That's interesting. And there's a hunger to learn. And I think that's got to be part of everyone's creative journeys that hunger to just keep learning and improving and changing and yes. that's that's really where the pleasure comes isn't it you know the learning and improving oh imagine sure. today. imagine the day when you go oh fuck me oh sorry excuse me oh that <laughs> painting's perfect 
that that would be a nightmare, wouldn't it? It's like every time you let you gotta yes. be oh, yeah. next time, next time I'll get. It. <laughs> Yeah, amen, man. I, I, there, there's something, there's something to that. I've often thought about that. I, I, I never want that day to come where I'm like, oh, I get it now. I understand. I understand. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've got this painting thing whipped. That's a beautiful no, thing insane. about painting. You, you. Well, the, the, the beautiful thing about painting is that there, there's, there's so much to know. And, yeah. and, and how far can you push it really? I mean, when we look at the, the pinnacle of what's been achieved in <clears throat> portraiture or, or landscape painting, I'm not, I'm not going to say that there will never be another Rembrandt. There might be somewhere born sometime, maybe in the future, or maybe there's somebody who's just as good as Rembrandt now. But right. it's, it's, really, so. it's really hard to look at a Rembrandt painting and go, oh, yeah, yeah, I get it. I'll, I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah. To me, I still look at it and I go, how? How? Yeah, what do I, do? I wish it's you were just... still alive so I could just talk to yeah. you and just ask yeah, you yeah. like hundreds of questions that are on my mind about how you achieve that translucency in your paint surface. Or, you know, you look at one of these like 19th century. OK, I, I'll give you an example. I went to um, when I was still living in Australia. We went up to a place called Bendigo and there was a 19th century uh, collection of work where it was traveling from the Royal Academy in London and it was just going around. And this was a bunch of the old masters when they were kind of young, just starting out and a lot of student work as oh, well. Right. Really interesting stuff. And there was one Ooh. painting by John Singer Sargent and I was looking at this painting. It was a Venetian interior. And I just was like, I, I know nothing about painting. There was one yeah. guy who was kind of sitting at a table, at a dining table and the character in this guy's face and the, the, the yeah. kind of, you could tell almost what he was thinking. I mean, it sounds like BS, yeah. but it really, I was looking at it just going, wow. Uh, and then when I, I got up it. close to the painting, it was literally two or three marks. He just went with a brush, twist, scrape, blop, yeah. and that was it. And it's like, it's there. And I'm like, I feel like I know that guy that you just painted. I yeah. feel, and, and when I looked at it, I was like, I know nothing. I know absolutely yeah. nothing. So, you know, it, the minute I try and, or, or start to get a little bit high and mighty, it's important to kind of humble myself oh, yeah. and just go smack right. down again. Yeah. yeah. And, and being on social media as well, like there are, there are some monsters out there in today's world who are just, I mean, you mentioned Sean Cheatham. Uh, I hope to interview him in, in a coming podcast and, and uh, like Sean's a beast. Oh it's, my God, Sean is like, it's nuts. he's just, he's so good. And I mean, he's making these amazing knives now. He's really got into that. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, he, he's got really making beautiful knives. But he, there's a simplicity in what he does that is not simple, is incredibly complex and incredibly nuanced and, and character driven. And he, um, I built his website for him actually because he was, he's so relaxed and chilled about, you know, he's, mm. he's been doing it for so long. He's just wasn't really worried about like publicity and all the rest of it and, and doing it. I think he got a little bit jaded with the whole art business in, in a way mm. um, because he was doing these workshops and, and earning really good money doing them and, you know, selling uh, studies and, and selling work occasionally. But I think he just got sort of a little bit, um, I don't know, just jaded with the industry and just doesn't, perhaps doesn't appreciate how much people want to see his bigger figurative works. Mm. I certainly do. I'm always banging on at him. When are we going to see, you know, <laughs> another big series of, of your work? And, you know, it's people like that that I think in years to come, people will look back and go, oh, my God, that was a master. You know, that was someone at work that, that mm. you know, there are, there are so many out there. And that's what going back to seeing paintings in real life. Mm. If you see uh, Mitch Griffith's work on Instagram, mm. I mean, it's beautiful. I mean, it's stunning. But if you see a Mitch Griffith painting in real life, it's just, I want to be sick sometimes. When I see it, I'm just like, I am nothing. What, how dare I, you know, <laughs> share in airspace with this guy? He's yeah. just so good. It's just painful to me. There's loads of people like that. Carl Dobsky is another one that I just think, oh, you know, some of the work he does. Nick Arm, he's got a show at Arcadia, I think, at the moment. His work is just Flipping out. There's just this, there's a beauty and a simplicity to it that just makes me look at my work and just hate all of it and just think, what am I doing? How how dare I? 
you know, and it's, but that's good because it encourages me. It's like, okay, well, I dare. I'm going to give it a shot and I'm going to keep trying. And as long as people keep buying paintings, I, I'm allowed to do it, you know. And, sure. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, man, it's social media. Oh, it just does my nothing. Absolutely drives me crazy. <laughs> I can't bear it. I, I uninstall it on my phone, right? Because I don't want to be confronted by it during the day when I'm working, yeah. you know, to be reminded that I'm just not as good as, as these other people. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting point of view. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah I, I, look, I, 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 can, I can kind of sometimes uh, buy into that mindset, Um uh, to me, yeah, and, and I and I hear exactly what you're saying. I mean, it is it is enormously inspiring, but sometimes it is, it does, uh, yeah, it does threaten your existence a little bit. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I think that everyone successful that I admire has that imposter syndrome. You know, it has yeah. it, it. People don't can't quite believe that they're there. You know, they yeah. you hear really successful people and they're yeah. always a little bit su surprised at their success. Yeah. And I think it's because we all are like, can't quite believe it. You know, that yeah. when when you do something and it does work, yeah. that you're allowed to do it. You know, yeah. it's like, really, I'm, a, I'm allowed to I'm having such a good time. And I'm actually yeah. allowed to do this. There are better people that can do this. Why you? Why do you let me into this crowd? And uh, I really struggled with that in the beginning when I first signed with the gallery. I really struggled with it. Now I'm like, okay, I've sold a few now. I'm allowed to at least step into the arena a little bit, you know. But I definitely don't ever feel that I'm anywhere near like my art heroes, contemporary art heroes. Never mind the bloody masters, you know. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's, it's a really. It, yeah. It's something that I think it's healthy to to have a, a massive respect for these uh, these other artists. It is. It, but it is important at the same time, but I, and I'm sure you'd agree with this. It, you know, don't don't ever let that kind of feeling break you. Don't don't let it no. kind of you know. Yes, have a have a healthy respect and be aware of of what other people are doing. But do show up. Do do try. It, do do get in there and wrestle with these things. But, you know, keep that feeling in check, you know, a massive part of it, you know, social media as well. Like it, it's it's the best thing ever. It's the worst thing ever. It's it's both. And I remember um, when I when I first got onto social media and just looking at the followings of some of the people just in Australia, where not when I first got on to Instagram and Facebook and people that. We're just, you know, doing pretty well. But then you'd look at the hundreds of thousands of followers. I'm like, are you kidding? And I look at my thousand followers at the time or whatever it was. I'm like, oh, I'll never get there. I'll never get there. And then I suddenly got into this mindset where it's like, why are you comparing yourself to anybody else? You know, at the end of the day, art, art is this wonderful thing where it's not a race. It's not a competition at all. This is why I do not take part in competitions. I, I can't stand competitions. I love shows. I love group shows. Absolutely. But it, it's, it's, it's about doing the very best that you can do on an individual level. It's like, what, what's in you? Let's distill that. Let's get that out. And let's, let's really talk about that and explore that. Because what you're expressing is unique. I mean, look. Nick Alm's great. Mitch Griffiths is is a modern master, as is Sean Cheatham. But none of these people, like, I, I, again, I mean, I, I look at what you're doing, and I'm just like, dude, like, there's some ideas and stuff that you're executing on that I've never seen in my life. And I'm just like, what a crazy, mental, awesome idea. Like, and if you didn't, I mean, not just you, but like anybody, I guess, listening to this, even for myself, like if, if you didn't execute on those little things that, that are, are just might seem like just a weird idea, just a little flash in the brain, you might be the only one charged with that bit of inspiration to give birth to that idea. And if you don't execute on that and you buy into the, you know, how dare I or imposter syndrome. And, and I know, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not saying that so much for you. Like, I know you've got that, that whipped. I mean, I, but it's, I just, I, I, I often think it's, it's um, I don't know if it was Les Brown or one of those motivational speaker types who was saying, you know, how many, how many ideas and dreams and, and businesses and goals are still in the graveyard? 
that, that were never yeah. lived out, you know? No, 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 definitely. No, I think you're absolutely right. You can't let it whip you. But I think that it's 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 knowing that you're not the only one feeling like that. You know, yeah, that even yeah, yeah, the greats yeah. feel like that, feel that they are imposters, even when they're massive successes and they don't quite understand, you know, their success and that, yeah. that it's okay to feel yeah. like that because everyone does. And it's only the super arrogant weirdos, who, you know, you sometimes <laughs> see on X Factor or one of these like talent shows where they just believe that they're amazing. You just think... Really? Has nobody <laughs> told you? <laughs> you know? yeah, it's, yeah. It, I, I think there's, I've never met a successful person that I respect who doesn't, you know, worry that yeah. it's all going to come to an end, you know, any moment, but still gets up every day and does it, you know, just like you do, like I do, like mm. so many people do. You've got to get up every day in spite of the fact that you don't believe you belong or whatever else. And it's, mm. uh, you know, that's the thing that's bloody hard, you know. You, can you imagine if you were just like a postman or something? You'd get up and maybe we'd walk your dog and post some letters and stuff, and it might be, maybe have a really, really lovely lifestyle. How awesome would it be if you actually wanted to do that and that was your job and you were super content? I wish that that's what I wanted to do sometimes, yeah. but I can't do that. I have to do this. And yeah. sometimes it's a curse, you know? Mm. It is my blessing and my curse. <laughs> it's just one of those things that you that you have to do it. And sometimes you curse yourself for having to be that person that wants to create and wants to build and wants to wants to do these things because it'd be so much simpler to be happy with no creative ambition. <laughs> you know? Yeah, for sure. For sure. So I think I think the key there is 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 living out that thing that uh, is your calling and what you feel is your purpose to actually do that thing and, and yeah. not, not let up on that pursuit. Just keep driving at it. Um, yeah. That's absolutely essential. Absolutely essential. Yeah. You know, you can do it. This is the thing. You know, there's nothing special about anyone really i mean obviously there's a bit of talent that you need no doubt you've got to have some but i think that the real talent is the grit that you need right mm -hmm. yeah. it's that what's that great rocky saying it's not how hard you can hit but how many times you can get hit and still keep getting up it's something like that yeah. right yeah 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 yeah, I love that's, it. I really feel that that's so important because you're going to get rejected so many times and it's so tedious and you just think, oh, why am I doing this? Mm. So, and But it, it's that getting up every time and then you have that little bit of success and then another little bit of success and, mm -hmm. and you start thinking, wait a minute, this might actually be something. And then you'll get knocked right back down again, but you know that you've had that bit of success and it will come again. And I think that it, that is ultimately in any creative business – is that being able to keep coming back over and over and over again. That that's really ultimately what does it. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure, man. I mean, I, I was rejected from every single gallery I approached when I first started up. Every single one. Yeah. They're just like, you're, you're not good enough. Sorry. Uh, they feel sick now, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> and they I, see these beautiful paintings. They're so I, sick. I, I got I got an email from one dude uh, that was it was particularly uh, particularly rude uh, about it and um, and he just said no nah, look your work's drab it's boring sorry I'm not I'm not going to take it on and then it was years later that he's like oh I've heard a lot about you you really you know you're great I'd love to take on some of your work if you know I have this gallery I'm not sure if you're aware of us didn't remember me from anything anybody. And, and I just, I didn't even answer his email. Didn't even have the courtesy to answer his email. I just let it go. I'm like, ha ha, uh, got ya. That's not, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You should have just replied with his last email. <laughs> well, oh, it was, it was well, all done in purpose. This guy? I, no, I, I showed up, I, the rookie mistake. I showed up to the gallery unannounced with paintings under my arms. So maybe that, that was, you know, that was, that was, that was a bad move, but I mean, still, uh, you know, it was, and it wasn't great work. You don't have to be that way. You don't have to reject people that way at all. You know, there's a there's a much nicer way of saying, well, this isn't for us. Simple I, as that. I was a kid too. Like I was really young. Like I would have been yeah. maybe twenty, probably around twenty. Yeah, like like a young young, and I was just like. Uh, anybody else, I think some of that would have just really really broken. That yeah, and and for no a doubt. while, if I'm honest, for a while it broke me. I was like, oh, maybe I'm not cut out. But then I was like, no, I'm going to get good. I'm going to get really good. And I thought I was yeah. good. 
Like I thought, like, I, I mean, I, I was always the kid that drew. I was, everyone had told well, me I, my whole life in school. Oh yeah, Tish, he's yeah. awesome at, at drawing and painting. He'll be, he'll be right. Um, but yeah. I, I just, there was something about this that just in a commercial sense, they couldn't see how they could sell that, that work. I can't even remember <laughs> what it was. It would have been a lot of landscape, seascape stuff, but um, right. yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> nah. Let them go. Let them go. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm, I'm kind of glad now to have the story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Got to have a good couple of anecdotes. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Vince, this has been a real treat talking to you, hearing your story, uh, you know, sharing all these ideas with you and just hearing more about what makes you tick creatively. I've had a blast. Thank you so much for being on The Creative Endeavor. Oh, mate, this has been really, really fun for me. Uh, as I said, I've been listening to your podcast and I loved your work for so long. It's been an absolute privilege to be on your show and uh, mate, absolutely loved it. Well, I really hope that you've enjoyed this episode of The Creative Endeavor and a huge thank you to Vince Camp for joining me. Now, if you wanna see more of Vince's work, then you can find him on Instagram, at Vince Camp and on his website, www.vincentcamp.com. Now, again, I hope you enjoyed this wherever you are in the world. Everybody is going through a bunch right now with this recent global crisis. And I just wanted to take an opportunity to just reaffirm my commitment to you. I'm gonna be doubling my efforts here. A lot of people are out of work. A lot of people are really hurting right now. And what I'm gonna try and do just for what it's worth is I'm gonna be doubling those efforts and try and bring you even more quality, free content, so you've got something to listen to, maybe to take your mind off all the bad news that's happening at the moment. But I've got plenty more videos on the way, lots more podcasts, lots more YouTube tutorials, so you can count on me to provide a creative, artistic distraction from all of the chaos. And I hope we're past it very, very soon. So I hope this finds you well. And look, if you like this episode, then please do me a favor, click that like button for me, leave me a comment down below, and make sure you're subscribed to this channel. Click the notification icon so you're notified next time I upload a video. But most important, make sure you subscribe through my website at andrewtischler.com. Thanks so much for stopping by. I've enjoyed your company and I look forward to seeing you again very, very soon.